What better accomplishment can there be than living for eternity? Seeing civilization thrive, endless investing, watching your loved ones slowly decay around you? Yeah, immortality seems pretty great, and a lot of people throughout history thought so too. They spend years of their temporary stay on Earth attempting to make it a little bit more permanent. So let's take a look at how people have attempted to extend their normal lifespan. When you think of mummies, the first thing that probably comes to mind is ancient Egypt where pharaohs were often mummified after their deaths, preserving their remains well beyond their normal decaying timeline. But what if they began mummifying themselves while they were alive? Well, that's what a small sect of Japanese Buddhism used to practice. Motivations for doing so can vary from selfless acts of sacrifice to protect others, or just to achieve spiritual ascension and be worshipped for all eternity. Those brave enough to take on the process, known as Soku Shimbotsu, start off by quite literally eating trees. The diet, called Mokujiki, or tree eating, limited practitioners to nutritional staples such as nuts, berries, tree bark, and even tree resin. Just deep throw an entire cherry blossom down to the roots and call it a day. After 2,000 days of the strict diet, the monk would be encased in a tomb with holes poked in it for air like they were a pet hamster about to be absolutely manhandled by a toddler. They were also supplied with a bell which they would ring daily to tell everyone, nope, still not a mummy yet. They would spend their days reciting prayers and munching on their tree skits, slowly taking on the form of a hearty beef jerky. Once the bell stopped ringing, it was showtime. The tomb would be completely sealed for 1,000 days just to be extra sure things would go right. Afterward, the tomb would be open to see if the monk was successful or not. At worst, they rotted away into a neighborhood favorite Halloween prop. And at best, they gained the ability to give Link cool Sheikah Slate upgrades. Since blood is the life fluid that we all have pumping around our big hulking meat sacks, why not frequently change it out like you would your car's oil? Surely it needs to be refreshed every once in a while. Out with the old, in with the new. That was Soviet physician Alexander Bogdanov's theory anyway. He saw blood transfusion as a therapeutic stimulant and wanted to test out its benefits firsthand. After abandoning politics in 1924 because Soviet Russia's communism wasn't communisming enough, Alex finally had the time to get around to some good old blood swapping. He took a deep dive into blood experimentation in hopes of unlocking eternal youth, or at least extending the normal human lifespan. Blood transfusions nowadays are one-sided. A needy patient receives blood from a healthy donor, and that's that. Alex, on the other hand, treated blood transfusions as more of an equivalent exchange versus a one-way donation. Two willing participants would trade out about a liter of blood to each other. The theory was that the participants would inherit each other's strengths, an older person would inherit youth from a younger partner, who would in turn get a plus five on all future wisdom rolls. Hey bro, you uh, you wanna swap blood? Well, what can you deadlift? 400 pounds. Sold. <laughs> <laughs> Bogdanov himself participated in 11 of his own transfusion experiments. After receiving the blood, he noted how he felt rejuvenated, regained eyesight, slowed his baldness, and increased his daily rub-out limit to 3. It looked like Bogdanov was well on his way to attaining immortality. But like the story of Icarus, he just couldn't push that boulder up the mountain. Or something. I, I don't read Greek mythology. After his 12th transfusion with a less than ideal partner who may or may not have been infected with malaria and tuberculosis, he somehow became very sick and died in 1928. No, this isn't slamming down several cold ones while in a Lamb of God wall of death. Instead, we will take a trip back to Imperial China when the first emperor reigned. Qin Shu Huang declared himself emperor of unified China once he thoroughly convinced the other six Chinese states to bend to his will. Hey guys, you uh, want to become a unified China? No, no we're good. I, I no, think I'm fine. Yeah, no, maybe well, later? Okay, how, how about now? Yay! As a bonus, his military strengths translated well into leadership qualities. Under his rule, he standardized many aspects of normal life. Currency, units of measurement, language, and laws were now universal across a unified China. He created networks of new roads, canals, and irrigation systems, allowing trade to flourish. In order to protect his new kingdom like a proud dad, he tied his new balances tight and ordered the construction of a great big beautiful defensive wall that would be admired for millennia. After all, he made the bold claim that his kingdom would reign for more than 10,000 generations after him. Now, while Huang sounds pretty neat, he was a bit of a dick. 
He taxed the balls off of poor people, had historic and cultural documents burned, and executed anyone who went against his ideas. In doing so, he became isolated and hated. He was also completely bonked out of his gourd, lusting for eternal power and life, sending alchemists away on expeditions in search of the legendary elixir of life, even sometimes joining their journeys himself. His alchemical friends would frequently offer him potions and concoctions with the promise that they would at least extend his health bar a little bit while they searched for the elixir. Problem was, these potions contained mercury, a highly toxic liquid metal. But let's be honest, if you handed someone who is desperate for eternal life a bottle of stuff that looks like this, they're gonna go, Oh hell yeah! And toss it back faster than you can say, wait, don't drink that. Emperor Qin Shu Huang died at the ripe old age of 49, a few infinities short of his goal. Oh, and his empire collapsed a few years later. No! If you've ever wanted to treat your body like some bad leftovers, then look no further than cryonics, the scientific technique of freezing your body in extremely low temperatures. Don't you mean cryogenics, I hear you ask? No, cryogenics is just the process of producing low temperatures. This is cryonics. Anyway, the theory is that you freeze your body and brain in temperatures low enough to halt all deterioration. The hope is that one day you can be thawed out and just resume your life as if nothing ever happened. There was a guy born in Belgium in 1930 by the name of... Uh, this who was a bit of a visionary. He would often speculate on how humans would innovate technology as time went on, being able to eventually solve any problem, including death. He also thought that modern politics were wasteful and outdated, that the only people who really exist are those who look to the future for change or those who stay in the past and cling to tradition. Speaking of tradition, he also believed that traditional names were stupid so he changed his own to FM2030. Much easier to pronounce. Besides sounding like a child of Elon Musk, FM's name change highlighted his goal of celebrating his 100th birthday in the year 2030. He believed that by then, humanity will be ageless, everyone will have an opportunity to live forever, and world peace will finally be attained. <laughs> Good one. Unfortunately for him, his pancreas clung to the tradition of failing, and so he died in 2000 at the age of nice. To keep his dream alive now that everything else was dead, his remains were placed in a cryonic suspension in Arizona by the Alcor Life Extension Foundation, where they still exist today. Of course, it has to be said that there's no existing scientific evidence to suggest that cryopreservation can even be successful. The practice is often regarded as pseudoscience and a scam. Since clients are required to be legally dead and slammed full of antifreeze, it's impossible to resuscitate them. Like FM, hundreds of people have either had their remains cryopreserved or have made arrangements to do so after death. Even American superstar Jeffrey Epstein wanted his head and wiener frozen for future mischief. But we all know how that turned out. The gamble here is if the companies performing the storage will even be in business long enough to carry out their end of the bargain. Cryopreservation has been a thing since the 60s and 70s, but most of those companies went bankrupt, so their inventory of bodies were gently thawed and respectfully disposed of. Dr. Charles Brown Sackard was highly regarded by his peers in the medical community. He was a pioneer of sensory experiments on the spinal cord, as well as in-depth studies on the nervous system. But he was a bit off in some ways. He often performed radical experiments on himself, which would raise questions about his sanity. For example, when trying to figure out the cure for cholera, he wanted to determine how the disease was spread. When observing a cholera patient violently vomiting, he decided to catch the vomit in his own mouth and swallowed it. As is typical with aging, Charles found himself losing strength and stamina by age 72. Well, he took that personally and tried to find a way to regain his youth. After countless animal experimentations, he came up with a serum. One made from crushed up dog and guinea pig testicles mixed with blood. He injected himself with this serum and noted how he was able to lift heavier weight and even his pee stream was stronger, which is a pretty great benchmark to measure improvement. When presenting his findings to his colleagues, they were all, <laughs> are you serious, dude? His reputation was thrown into the toilet and he quickly became a laughing stock of the medical community. Looking back, it is likely that the serum that Charles injected contained a small amount of testosterone, which is why he experienced some positive results. Even though he was dismissed by his peers, he still offered the therapy to aging men wishing to regain and retain youth. Thousands of men were reported to have tried the serum, with some claiming the same effect as Charles. Though, it is now likely to have simply been a placebo effect. Charles died four years later at age 76.
So, that's just a few examples of how people have tried to attain immortality. No reported cases of success yet, but we can keep on trying. Remember that life isn't really about how much time you have, it's about how you spend it. And you don't want to be on your deathbed regretting not watching more chat history, do you? Do you? <laughs>